This video is brought to you by viewers like you. August 8th, 2016. The election cycle is in full swing. Suddenly, the news breaks. It's official. Bernie Sanders closed a deal on a beautiful $575,000 summer home in the Champlain Islands. His third home. At the time, the story didn't gain a lot of traction. The media had largely moved on from covering Sanders and was focusing on the slam dunk victory Hillary had come November. It wasn't until his second run for presidency in 2020 that attacks focused on his love for homes started rolling out. Articles like The Secret of Bernie's Millions ran with the idea of the once radical socialist turned hypocrite millionaire. While the stories were a little scandalous, what they claimed was fundamentally true. Bernie Sanders did have a net worth of $2 million. He was a very comfortable member of the bourgeoisie he railed against. And not only was he wealthy, the once radical activist had toned down some of his more overtly anti-capitalist principles. During the four years between 2016 and 2020 alone, he was railing against billionaires a whole lot less and saying billionaires, billionaire, billionaire, almost exclusively. At best, Sanders was moderating his message, but at worst, he wasn't just a hypocrite, he was a traitor. This is the line of attack real-life Scrooge McDuck, Michael Bloomberg, chose to attack Bernie Sanders with in the Democratic debates. What a wonderful country we have. The best-known socialist in the country happens to be a millionaire with three houses. What I miss here? Compared to Bloomberg, Bernie Sanders might as well be a homeless guy begging for money on the street. He's worth a ludicrous $60 billion versus Bernie's now $3 million. Clearly, this attack wasn't done in good faith. And it's not exactly a novel critique either. In fact, it's over a hundred years old. UK Prime Minister Ramsay MacDonald was accused of being a champagne socialist and a class trader way back in the 1930s for associating with the rich and famous and betraying the working class in a crucial labor dispute. Seeing as the left hasn't exactly been in a position of power for a long time in either the USA or the UK, Accusations of champagne socialism have mainly been relegated to C-list internet celebrities. Take Nico Lul as an example, an internet streamer who went viral wearing a Bernie 2020 shirt and dancing on TikTok, who faced a media shitstorm after posting a $2 million apartment tour. Hey guys, welcome to my apartment! Not only are you in an excessive apartment, but you bought things that are excessive? Ooh, tax the rich, yeah, whatever. <laughs> 38,000 dislikes! What the f Okay, liar. <laughs> Whatever you say, liar. Hasanabi, a political commentator and one of Twitch's largest streamers, went through a similar thing after buying a multi-million dollar home in West LA. I think it's a little funny when a guy who spends his whole life shitting on somebody like Bezos and then signs an exclusive contract with Bezos so that he can make millions of dollars to go and buy million dollar mansions. That's funny to me. Their audience is completely unaware that they are no longer one of them. They are the elite. And most recently, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has been accused of tacky champagne socialism for wearing a Tax the Rich dress to the exclusive Met Gala. This outfit has drawn mixed reactions from the public for promoting the message at an event that cost more than $30,000 per ticket. I thought it was cringe. I just thought it was cringe. Just, you're a lawmaker. Yeah, tax the rich. Like, just do it. So, she is AOC Antoinette, and this is the perfect event for her. The Champagne Socialists all get together once a year. In all of these cases, the socialist celebrities also had more than their fair share of supporters. But the criticisms are especially interesting, because on the face of it, these attacks don't make a lot of sense. Being rich shouldn't disqualify you from advocating for social equality. Money is power, and while people power is important, you need a lot of money to fight for a better world. The only reason the patron saint of socialism, Karl Marx, could write about the flaws of capitalism was because his buddy Engels was a member of the bourgeoisie and he used that money to support the cause. And if you were a socialist when you were broke and remained one when you became rich, that should give you more legitimacy not less. Which is exactly what we saw with Bernie Sanders, who stands as a shining example of ideological consistency, with decades of speeches that sound remarkably similar to what he says today. 
people trust Bernie Sanders, and it's why most of his opponents chose to attack him based on the merits of his argument and not the content of his character. And those who did choose to attack him on the content of his character, like Elizabeth Warren, had it fail spectacularly. But what happens if people don't trust you? That's the situation a lot of socialist celebrities find themselves in today. There's a lot of confusion on how we should understand internet influencers, so let's look at it sociologically. Everyone from the woman who made your phone and the McDonald's shift manager to the millionaire Twitch streamer and big league football players are working class if they rely on selling their labor to make a living. If you have to sell your body, time, and mind in exchange for money, no matter how much money that is, you are part of the working class. The capitalist, business, or ownership class, whatever you want to call them, don't have to sell their labor. Their money works for them. And at the upper echelons of society, they're the billionaires who own industries, employ you, and frankly, run the world. This is a gross simplification of the global class system because even within classes there are contradictions and distinctions. For example, workers in the developing world who create goods for people all over the world are hyper exploited. They receive a mere fraction of the value they create and that stolen value creates super profits that flow back towards the developed countries. These super profits fuel the higher wages, higher levels of consumption, and social benefits the working class in the developed world enjoys. Internet influencers enjoy one of the most privileged positions within the global working class. They are highly skilled, self-employed entertainers whose labor generates income other workers could only dream of. Don't get me wrong, they're still exploited. Social media platforms siphon a tremendous amount of profit off of the work of these personalities, and while video hosting can be expensive, they still manage to turn massive profits almost entirely off of their presence. Many spend hundreds of hours per video or stream 14 hours per day and basically have to dedicate their entire lives to surviving in the attention economy where a week off can mean you're forgotten in favor of the flavor of the week. And only a few successful seed in this industry, there's thousands of others clawing for a shot at their job barely making ends meet. Regardless, they're still not working in warehouses, they don't have a boss sniffing down their neck, it's good work. And at the top, a lot of them do make the jump to the ownership class by employing others, starting a small business, and investing their millions so they never really have to work ever again. Internet celebritydom is an industry of extremes. On the one end, broke young people trying to make it in, and on the other, mega millionaire business owners. And it's that thin line these celebrities have to tread that makes them vulnerable to accusations of champagne socialism. Because ostensibly, if you believe in social equality, then you'd live your life differently to every other capitalist in the game. There's a common refrain for socialists that there is no ethical consumption under capitalism, which is just a fancy way of saying no matter what products you buy or how you live, you're going to technically be exploiting someone on the other side of the world because that's just how the world is set up. And it is true, but it's not an excuse to not at least try to live more ethically. No one gets mad at some broke-ass streamer streaming for 10 viewers because they have no power. Remember, money is power and socialist celebrities who have wealth have the power to exploit others as members of the business class. As viewers, we don't have a clear insight into what the business side looks like. Are they ethically paying their editors? Are their merch using basically slave labor? We don't know. We just have to trust them. And in the online economy, trust is the name of the game. It's the backbone of the parasocial relationships you form with your audience that lead to views and revenue. While political content only makes up a small sliver of the online content overall, it's large enough that online leftism has become a multi-million dollar market. From ad revenue generated off of high viewership numbers, direct donations, and merch sales, it's an economy with tens of millions of dollars in circulation, if not more. 
It's the reason why there's been an explosion in small creators like myself. It's a growing market that we haven't seen reach its carrying capacity. And when you combine political advocacy with the possibilities of personal enrichment, questions of legitimacy are bound to arise. While Hasanabi and Nico Lul are the two most recent targets of the criticism, similar conversations have been happening for a while now. Both Chapo Trap House, ContraPoints, and various other creators have been criticized for raking in massive amounts of money off talking about social equality, to the point that many have hidden their Patreon numbers altogether. These criticisms are usually conjured up by right-wing personalities who use the veil of supporting the working class while advocating for policy that directly supports the rich. Democrats have become the party of the elite professional class, eager to lecture you about open borders, global warming from their gated communities. These people we can safely ignore. But more and more, it's been people within the left that have been throwing these accusations. And before we get into the high-minded analysis, we have to admit that a lot of this is just petty online infighting. The left isn't exactly in a position of power, so instead of approaching politics in terms of building that power in the real world, a lot of people tend to approach it as a team sport in a battle of identities, and anyone who doesn't match their exact theoretical politics becomes an enemy. And a lot of the time, these critiques come from small creators trying to establish their own online brand by gnawing at the heels of the celebrity. Whether these are legitimate claims or just self-interested clout chasing, I'll leave that for you to decide. But I don't think we can dismiss all of it as just clout chasing or meaningless infighting. The rage directed at socialist celebrities is real and it isn't going away anytime soon. I would know because I'm not even gonna lie, I've kind of been a massive hater on some of these personalities. I've made some pretty angry video essays of them in the past, and while I've tried to move past that style of content and have a more loving oriented form of politics, I deeply understand where the hate is coming from. I come from a working class background, an immigrant working class family in a working class community. When applying to college, everyone I knew qualified for the California Blue and Gold Opportunity Plan that covers all costs of attending a four-year institution if your family makes under 80k a year. Everyone I knew qualified except for one person. She wasn't rich, like at all. Her family was undocumented, her parents worked shitty dead-end jobs that just barely put them over the income limit, and the cost of university was going to be debilitating to them. But to us, she was rich. Like, rich rich. Like, damn, you have to pay for college? <laughs> Since when have you been rich? Couldn't be me. That was our working perspective of wealth. Being rich in the hood is a lot different than being rich in suburbia. And when we carry these perspectives into the different spaces we go to, like the internet, where we interact with people from all kinds of different backgrounds, we get situations like this tweet by at crush the bigots asking, if someone makes over 400,000 per year, do you consider them rich? Which gave us responses like, depends, where do they live? And no, that's just middle class, which is obviously mental. That's beyond the top 1% of income earners. But again, perspectives of wealth, right? A $2 million home means completely different things to someone who's middle class and to someone who's third world poor. It'll be an understandable purchase for one person and probably trigger deep class resentment in another. That's not to say wealth can't be measured objectively, it can, just like you can judge what your objective relationship to the means of production is. But arbitrating how much wealth is too much within the working class is messy, and it's not something I'm interested in doing. But that's not to say I don't feel class resentment all the time. I had the privilege of going to a college with an average family income of over $100,000 per year. And when I learned that the friends I had made came from rich families, from the suburbs with beautiful two-story houses with pools, I felt the same twang of class resentment I had felt when I read the stories of Bernie Sanders' millions. It's a hard feeling to describe, and I'm sure it's different for every person. Movies like Parasite and Joker try to express the feeling visually, but in words? Indignation, isolation, betrayal. A feeling that these people could never understand what you've been through or who you are because of your class. And the fact that your background is so closely intertwined to who you are 
It's shocking to learn that there's actually a gaping chasm between you and someone you knew that you never saw before. Anyone who's ever had the revelation that they're the poorest person in the room has felt something similar to this. In the world of the interpersonal, giving this feeling any power is toxic. Class resentment is just one toxic resentment that can spiral out of control, like feeling resentment towards your more privileged white friends or trans friends who can pass better than you. The list goes on. Life is unfair, but unleashing that negativity towards others who have no control over your situation is just toxic. Hate the sin, not the sinner, you know, all that. A lot of the hate these figures face stems from a parasocial variety of this exact kind of social phenomena where the celebrity becomes the target of unfulfilled basement people projecting their own insecurities onto what these figures represent to them. And while we can wholeheartedly condemn this behavior, when we move on from the interpersonal to talk about class resentment politically, that's a whole different story. Because in politics, rage is everything. In Jennifer M. Silva's book, We're Still Here, the author follows a diverse group of working class families in which pain, struggle, and cynicism make up the bulk of their lives. The stories in the book are really tough to listen to, with the interviewees opening up about their abuse and traumas, and the effects of the struggle these people go through creates a lasting, pervasive, intergenerational cynicism that influences their worldview and political participation, or lack thereof. While Silva's book focuses primarily on the economically stagnant Rust Belt communities in the United States, this cynicism is familiar to anybody from poor, immigrant, black, or indigenous communities. A lot of the people in the book, of all races, voted for Trump, the first recent politician in the United States to really tap into the politically resentful and transform their rage into action. But not all rage goes that way. Other times, it's directed into anti-institutional action. These two things are obviously not equivalent, but I compare them because they're the two most significant moments in US politics during the last five years, and in the lives of common people, they manifest through similar logic. Struggle, trauma, distrust, cynicism, outrage, action. To put a number on this rage and cynicism, only about one in four trust the federal government, and the percentage that trusts the media is down to the 40s. The most commonly cited evidence of Americans' distrust in their institutions has been the lack of political participation in the country, with one third of people choosing not to vote at all. While 2020 whipped up participation to a 120 year high, political disengagement is just one facet of a lack of trust in our society. A more telling number is our perspective on the folk heroes of our society, the rich. Today, the majority of Americans believe the government favors the rich. One in three think the rich are greedy and about the same have negative feelings towards them. This negative feeling increases quite dramatically in people under 30. 44% of young people feel angry when they read or hear about rich people. 39% believe it's immoral for society to allow billionaires to exist. And 35% believe that citizens taking violent action against the rich may be justified. This is a wild statistic, but don't take this to mean that one in three young people believe in a Marxist revolution. Looking at polls like the ones above and interviews like the ones conducted by Jennifer M. Silva, this is an early, raw, undirected rage. People know something is wrong with society, but the same people that say billionaires are a problem are also likely to say they respect the rich for their hard work. It's not a cohesive ideology, which is why the accusations of champagne socialism are so enduring. Billionaires like Michael Bloomberg aren't stupid. With so much disciplined rage pulsing through the American electorate, you only have to prevent a few working class people from developing a clear class consciousness to keep socialists from winning in an election. 
just how many people were on the cusp of supporting Bernie Sanders, but when they learned that he was just like the rest of them, let their cynicism overpower hope and refused to engage entirely. The same rules apply to conservatives who use this to attack AOC, Hasanabi, etc, etc. So how do you combat this? What do we do about it? Well, there's a common impulse in liberal media to blame social media for tearing society apart, and they're not entirely wrong. It's proven that social media sites like Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube have had a measurable influence on political hate and violence by promoting anger-inducing content above all else. But Facebook isn't responsible for the United States being the most economically unequal it's ever been since recorded history. It's not responsible for the economic stagnancy in vast swaths of the country that make the working class susceptible to radicalization. Before social media, it was talk radio. And it'll be something else if these companies ever go down so long as the material conditions of our society don't change. So I ask again, how do we combat this? Obviously, you whip out Das Kapital and start lecturing people about capitalism and how technically this millionaire Twitch streamer is part of the working class, right? Well, not really. People who come to bat for rich socialists have to understand that theory does very little to convince the cynical. Like trying to convince a flat earther that the planet is round, you don't convince them with facts and logic. You have to fight the lack of trust at the core of their cynicism. You have to convince people to believe in hope when they've been burned every time. Sometimes this is just an impossible task. Some people are just too far gone, the trauma too overpowering in their daily lives, and that's just how it is. Everyone's gone through different shit and going to have shit they just can't accept. But even if you can't win over everybody, trust is won by action. If you do work in your community, if you support the causes you claim to support, and if you're genuinely not a grifter and lead by example, then you will build that trust and you'll have people to back you up whenever accusations of champion socialism start flying. Take American entrepreneur and CEO of Gravity Payments, Dan Price. He's the exact kind of loud, white tech bro the internet loves to dunk on. But he became famous in 2015 when he raised the minimum salary in his company to 70000 to help fund the raises, he lowered his own salary from 1 million to that same 70,000 a year. He's no radical socialist, he still owns the majority of the company and he's clearly not hurting for money. But that personal sacrifice has given him a lot of legitimacy as someone who means it when he talks about economic inequality. These are the kind of stunts that give you almost universal legitimacy. But that's only half of the problem. Socialist celebrities are political educators, and as political educators, they by and large do a good job. But inevitably, some of their followers become more radical than they are. Most current socialist celebrities tend to be AOC-style democratic socialists, which, while radical in the context of the United States, is still far more conservative than the revolutionary politics of the most influential socialist groups in the USA, like the Black Panthers, and the budding successors to those movements growing today. As someone who spent a good chunk of their time during the pandemic in weekly food and supply distributions, organizing in the United States is gaping deep into the void of poverty. It's a gaping, never-ending abyss of need, that lights a sense of overwhelming urgency within your soul that really nothing else could ever do. And there is nothing more frustrating than fighting for scraps to meet the needs of your community while socialist celebrities rake in hundreds of thousands of dollars by just talking about it. This is the second half of the problem these internet celebrities face. They create the people that end up despising them for their lack of urgency or participation in the movement. Which is no reason to send them hate. I mean, not everyone needs to be Harriet Tubman fighting in the trenches. The movement to fight for a better world requires participation from peoples at all levels of society, no matter how small. And we shouldn't let this rage fracture a movement that is already at a power disadvantage. But god damn is it an understandable rage. And it's something anyone on this half of the internet is gonna have to make sure they take into account when they're talking about socialism. So let's look at a socialist celebrity who really lives up to these ideals. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is a congresswoman who does a lot of work in her district to support mutual aid. She's incredibly popular as a congresswoman and she's a proud and out social democrat or democratic socialist, whatever you prefer. 
Her politics are as clear as can be. So everybody loves her, right? <laughs> Wrong! Well, after her little stunt in the Met Gala with her tax the rich dress, both right and left wing detractors called out the stunt as being performative, and it was performative. That's what political stunts are, performances. But it wasn't a very good one. Juxtapose her tax the rich dress with this recent clip of anti-war activist and veteran Mike Preisner interrupting a speech by former President George W. Bush. Mr. Bush, when are you going to apologize for the million Iraqis that are dead because you lied? You lied about weapons of mass destruction. You lied about connections to 9-11. You lied about Iraq being destroyed. You said you sent me to Iraq. You sent me to Iraq in 2003. My friends are dead. I think the clip speaks for itself. It's so incredibly powerful. It moves you. I've seen comments of people saying they started tearing up when they saw it. And it was successful. The clip has gone viral, it's made headlines without all the negativity of the AOC stunt. People who had no idea who Mike Preisner was are finding out about him and what he fights for. And yet no one's calling it performative. Even though it is, no one's convinced that this stunt is going to stop wars in the Middle East. But in its performance, it's effective. It taps into the pulsing American rage for good which is what separates it from the tax the rich stress. The world continues to trudge forward towards an inflection point. Wealth inequality that's only increasing and impending climate catastrophe, whip cracking horse riding border patrol guarding entrance to the nation. It's unlikely we'll return to normal ever again, if that even existed in the first place. Anything that remotely resembles the old America of celebrity worship, gaudy wealth and privilege is going to be rejected, and it's righteous indignation that's going to stick around. So socialist celebrities are going to have to be increasingly careful to make sure that a pursuit of trust and legitimacy guides everything they do. But what do you think? This script took me shit you not like four weeks to finish. <laughs> It was a tough one. I really just wanted to analyze this cultural moment. And uh, it's a little different from my, from my other videos, but hey, what can you do? Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, become a patron if you're able. Thank you to my current patrons. Patronage is optional, but deeply, deeply appreciated. And I'll see you in the next one.